Is being successful in business down to luck? Is it a sweet science? Is it about being in the right business at the right time? Or hard work and dedication? Well, if you're like me, a business owner that's always looking at improving and learning from the best, this podcast will be sharing real stories from real business journeys. Welcome to Real Talk, your podcast dedicated to interviewing successful entrepreneurs. All right, so welcome to Real Talk. Thanks ever so much for putting some time aside to come and talk to us. Not that you really had a choice, but nope. um, for everybody listening, just introduce yourself. Who are you? What company do you represent? My name's Matt Hutton. I'm a director at Bon Brian Architects, an architectural firm, <laughs> primarily based in Sheffield originally. Now I've got four offices all around the country. So how many people does Bon Brian employ all together? About 140 overall. Okay, so people's a big part of yeah. Bon Brian. So I would say that the majority of this talk that we'll have today is, is going to be geared around people management and leadership. Generally, the people that listen to the podcast will be entrepreneurs or senior management people that are looking at getting better results in the business. So. Uh, I know that you're not directly responsible for all those 140 people, but there'll be a level from a directorship level. Um, how hard would you say getting getting the right people in the business? How hard would you say that is? In terms of recruitment, yeah. or well, it, recruitment is, is going to be part of it. But yeah. Keeping good people. Keeping in the good. I'm going to say that's probably the hardest. Keeping thing. people energized and and motivated. I'd yeah. say must be a key part of what you do. Yeah, I'd say for us that's probably harder than recruitment. To be quite yeah. honest, I think recruitment is is good. We need to find the space to be able to recruit, obviously, yeah. and, and be able to afford to do that. Keeping people, keeping them motivated, keeping them happy is probably the hardest part of mm-hmm. my job and and the rest of the director's job day to day because a lot of our staff, certainly in Sheffield, have been there 10 years as a minimum. Yeah. So their expectations are very different to new people coming in through the door. So that's, yeah, it, it's hard, hard work, but part of the, um, I suppose, the, the challenge day to day that we all enjoy uh, doing, yeah. you know. That's what I like focusing on as the people in the business. So how, how would you, so what are some of the strategies that you deploy at Bon Brian without giving sort of the secrets away in regards to what you do? How, how do you make sure that you get that middle ground between having a business that people want to want to come and spend time at, sort of the beanbag element and free coffees, mm-hmm. and making sure that you've got that efficiency and, and productivity right? How do you, as a leadership team, make sure that you try and marry them? Culture must be a big part of it. Yeah, trying to create the right culture. In, in architecture, obviously, it can be based around the types of projects that you do as well, and yeah. trying to create opportunities for people at different levels mm-hmm. to experience all different types of projects and different elements of being within a project. Yeah. Whether that's working on a site or doing pictures or yeah. doing uh, bids or running projects and doing the details. So there's lots of different levels of where we try and focus experience, I suppose. So that's that's part of it. Um, yeah, it's a difficult question. It's trying to figure out what what are the elements that people enjoy about being at work beyond the day to day doing the doing the project? a lot a lot to do with your own makeup so maybe tell us a little bit about your journey to being a sort of a, a board level of a quite a well, probably one of the largest architecture mm. firms in the north of england so talk to us a little bit about how, that journey i mean did you wake up when you were 7 years old and decide that you wanted to be an architect or Not how, at all, how, no. okay, so how did that all work <clears throat> no i kind of um, i left school in uh, Nottingham, a little town in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, and I think I chose, I, it's really embarrassing to say this, but on the UCAS day, I just walked, looked down the list, looked across at architecture, saw it was seven years and thought, brilliant, I won't be, I'll be out of work for seven years. So that's really <laughs> That was really my mindset back then, which was crazy. But I knew it was kind of slightly better than that. I knew I liked art, I loved geography, I loved design. Yeah. So I thought we'll go and do that. Leeds Met offered me a place at quite a low, uh, a level result which was pretty good for me at the time because I was not particularly motivated yeah. or or focused on doing anything at, at school either I was kind mm. of more into basketball and football and things like that um, and then I kind of so I sort of fell into it really as a career ended up going to Leeds first couple of years kind of did all right you know I was, I was bumbling along the bottom I wasn't really applying myself and then I in before I started my third year my father actually got me a job in a uh, really awful print finishing factory in Nottingham where I was doing 12 hour shifts putting leaflets in a box and it was a real kind of light bulb moment of wow this could be the rest of my life uh, and then I went back to university that third year applied myself like I never had done in my life and ended up with the first and as soon as that happened I was just held bent on moving down to London and, and becoming the architect that I wanted to do because by that stage I'd really 
got the passion through one of the tutors actually who I um, really struck a relationship with and and he really turned me on to the idea of how much architecture could be a part of my life more than it just being this thing I was doing. I think uh, an important part of that story was this print finishing yeah, thing yeah. as well just yeah. not the tutor that inspired you but yeah. more I think that was a bit stroke of genius from your dad you think he, did that <laughs> he thinks it or? is now yeah. He def- it, have you had a conversation yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I'll only ever get the retrospective view of yeah, this. Yeah. So he thinks it, it was a stroke of genius of his because he could see me doing pretty well, but I wasn't really applying myself. Now, in the reality of, he would always get me a job within a day of coming back from university at any stage. Whether you liked it or not. Whether I liked it or not. So <laughs> I'd be a milkman or whatever. I'd be doing something. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it just happened to be this one. And I think it was the, the three months of being there and working with people and bless them you know they were they were lovely people but they were working there sometimes 20 30 years of their life on yeah. the same machine putting leaflets in a box and i had this massive opportunity as as one of the first kids out of my whole family with, with my sister to go to university that i was potentially throwing away so that started the journey and then when i got to london i got into a really good practice uh, to do my year out so they'd won practice of the year and i got into work the, onto the boss's house which is this amazing butterfly house cool. which expanded my brain a bit more and then i decided i wanted to go to the Bartlett, which was like the best university in pretty much in the, in the world so one of the top three for architecture and that really got me in that kind of my portfolio my drive and the stuff i'd done it um at work really got me in there and then i, I hit this massive learning curve being at the bottom, coming in at the bottom really, as the kid from Leeds, as the guy used to call me, yeah. um, to being at, at UCL and the Bartlett where everyone had been there throughout the whole career and they were incredibly driven people and super talented. So I just had to really focus on, on getting through it uh, and, and you know, passing, let alone, you know, doing anything more than that, which I did. I know, because you know, obviously people mm. that listen don't know that we've obviously got a relationship mm. outside of this podcast as well. But one, one of the things that I find really interesting is you're not the, the, the type to go out there and start giving people advice. Yeah. I know that's not you, but there'll be a lot of people that listen to that print finishing story and go, yeah, I'm probably, I'm all pre print finishing. Yeah. I'm going, yeah, that's probably me. You know, I'm not necessarily applying myself as much as what I possibly could. I could potentially do more and, and get more. If you were forced to give somebody some advice that's kind of at that stage, what advice would you give them? So I do I kind of do a bit of this yeah. now. I, I try to go back to um, like colleges and, and schools where they're kind of at that age that I was at where I was just not really, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, because I think I've got a duty as someone that's managed to come through that and do pretty well. It's the thing, yeah, yeah. there are a few pathways at times in life that you, sometimes you don't see. Uh, and I feel like sometimes my duty to go back in and talk to them. But it, it is about, um, for me, it was finding something that I truly loved and was passionate about. Yeah. I didn't really understand what it was. I knew there was an opportunity there, and I'm sure other people would would feel exactly the same. Um, but I kind of I needed somebody to kind of guide me and point me in that direction. So uh, it, there's no kind of silver bullet to this to me to say I'll go and tell them to do X. But when I meet people at, at various stages of their career of their lives, I try and figure out now what what their end goal needs to be and help them position kind of towards that. Yeah. It's not always... It's really difficult for lots it's of people. It's really difficult, though. yeah. Really difficult. And I, my, my suggestion to people is, doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're 20s going into mm. work for the first time, whether you're in your 50s, there's, there's still lots of people that don't really know whether the thing that they're doing is the thing. Yeah, yeah. I always say, just apply yourself. 100%. If you apply yourself 100% to something, you don't actually love it, you'll find out really quick. Yeah. Can like you did with your, with your print finishing, right? Okay, I'll just apply myself. Yeah. And really quickly, you knew through that application, this is probably not the career choice that you actually want and, and yeah. want to push through with. Commitment's absolutely the key. It was for me, coming out of the back of the print finishing place, going back to Leeds, when I got to London, it, it was almost no choice. So I'd made the commitment to go at the kind of against the will of my parents and yeah. family and friends and stuff but it's what I wanted to do so once I got there I had to commit mm. there was no choice so it was at eight o'clock in the morning start work finish it was like a job I treated it like a job and I worked yeah. as well at the same time because I couldn't afford to pay my way so beyond once that finished then then I did have a choice I either stay in London or 
at the time I met my now wife and she was in Sheffield. So How is she? Is she all right? Yeah, she's great. Having to put with you? Yeah, well, she yeah. deals with it, yeah. She's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's used to it now. I keep telling her it's going to get better, but yeah. I've been doing that it for will, about 20 years. It will years. happen at some point yeah, in time. Yeah, I've seen this sort of on the graph of knowing that delusional <laughs> zone that I've now realised you can't get out of. But yeah, so she knows what I'm like. She's seen this from, you know, from the bottom up. One of the exactly things that, that just came across and just popped into my head was at the same time when, when you came out of that, I'm not going to stay too much on this print finishing job. <laughs> yeah. I don't to think I'm holding <clears> on <throat> to it. You also, um, I can't remember who said it. It might have been Jim Rohn that said, you become the average of the five people that you spend most time with. Mm. And that's always resonating with that. Mm. You know, you make sure that you've got a good circle of people around you. And, and from that, when you decided, right, now I'm going to commit to doing something, you then started moving up into a different circle yeah. where you knew you knew that you needed to up your game in order to just stay stay at their level. Yeah. I think that's also for, formed part of your sort of personality as well, trying to associate with the right people. Definitely. I think part of the reason I'm here today um, with you specifically, but before that, I've always sought to find people that were effectively, I don't know, knew more about something that I did. Yeah. So I'd go in there and then try and, kind of pick out the the nuggets of what they were telling me, trying to like soak up everything they were doing. Um, and I've done that throughout my whole life. So when yeah. I was at the Bartlett, it was like you're thrown into all these people that are just ridiculously clever and amazing at architecture. And I'm just trying to take as much as I can from them. The same with the tutors. Uh, and they pushed and pushed and drove us really, really hard. But then when you get into work, you do the same. You try and find people that are like-minded, mm-hmm. you want, who you want to work with. And if you can't find it within your own work, and what I would you know suggest to other people is, is find other people within, within other businesses and other business leaders that you respect. Yeah. Pick up the phone and go and meet them because generally they will they will want to meet you. You know, they will have a chat with you. They'll talk to you about how they've done things and their personal drive. And again, you, it's not, it has to be personal. It's got to be bespoke to you. You can't just follow somebody else's path. But I have found working consistently with, with business leaders in and around the Sheffield region, obviously where we are, and asking them really detailed questions about things that they might not want to answer sometimes yeah. has really helped me out. So I've never, it's, it's not always got that. It's rare that you'll that. meet someone that you ask some advice and they're not prepared to No, you. exactly. It's really rare. Yeah. But plucking up the courage yeah. to go and look at it. Again, um, I don't want to be pulling, pulling um, sayings in from left, right and centre, but networking as a general rule is a really good way of speeding things up. Yeah. Um, big believer that your network is your net worth. Yeah. The more that you surround yourself with people that are going to help you expand. So for people that are maybe a little bit introverted, mm-hmm. uh, which I know you you were uh, you're introverted as well. What did you have to do to maybe come out of your shell a little bit to go? You know, I need to surround myself with people in this field and in this field and in this field in order to. Uh, sort of move my journey forward. What advice would you give someone that's introverted? Well, for me, what happened to me, I think I hit a bit of an imaginary brick wall yeah. or glass ceiling or whatever. Yeah. That's what happened to me. And it, I was finding myself becoming demotivated by not having those people around me. So yeah. then I started to go out and seek advice and seek support. Um, so I think if anyone's feeling like that in any situation, I'd, I'd definitely recommend just, just finding people within, if it's not your network, people that you know, friends, yeah. family, whatever, and say, well, I've got this problem. How can you come and help me? And I think that that's really worked for me. It's not, um, like I say, it's not an always a one, uh, sorry, silver bullet kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Not a one trick pony. No, no, there's kind of, a, it's a bit like a spider's web. There's lots of things that you need. I kind of think, and I do it now as a, as a director and a leader, I know what my gaps are in my personality yeah. and in my business as well. So I need to fill those gaps with people that can support me. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really good advice. So when you're trying to move your way up through a business, you can't do it on your own, it's impossible. You know, you can't be everything all the time. So finding people that are like-minded can work with you, mm-hmm. support you, that that always helped me. I sort of did it, I don't think I did it on purpose, but obviously subconsciously I was doing that all the way through my career. Because yeah. I knew where my gaps were at each stage, finding people that could work with me and support me, and then kind of building with them to that next stage. Uh, and that's good, I think a good part of bringing people with you as well, you know, in terms yeah. of if you've got an ethos and a, and a vision, you need people around you to help you do that as well. So what would you say the next stage is for, for you and for Bon Brian? What is it that you're looking at doing moving forward? So as a practice, we've been around for 32 years, I think yeah. now. I've been there for about 18. Uh, I've been a director for three or four years now. So the next stage for us is going to be, I guess, a change at board level. So yeah. we've, we've got six people on the board. We've got a number of people that will be moving on, I guess, in uh, in the near future, so natural progression. Yeah, so but thinking about succession planning really in terms of that that next level of, of development. 
it was a practice we are fully focused on on delivering things beyond architecture really so we call mm. it more than design that's our yeah. kind of tagline for it so architectures uh, and the services that we provide for that are always are going to do a certain amount of a fee income each year we're seeing through a lot of our kind of usp around strategic work and land acquisition and working with developers uh, th there's a there's a bigger opportunity there that we're maybe not looking at yet mm. so i think that's something we're starting to work through we have a number of kind of sub brands now whether it's living we're looking at an interior retrofit one for next year which will pick up on obviously all the carbon agenda and things that are happening at the moment in yeah. the world so we've got lots of ideas uh, and they're all kind of moving and converging at the moment towards uh, the start of next year we're also moving into new office in Sheffield City Centre as well next year, which is a big one good. for our guys uh, in Sheffield. But obviously we've got four officers and they're all growing and they're all doing incredibly well. So um, yeah, lots of lots of ideas that are floating. Good. Um, so I'm going to go back to that second question that I asked you mm. now that we've gone through kind of that story piece. Um, what are the focuses for, for you, not necessarily Bond Brian, but more about your makeup when it comes to people and people management? For anybody that's listening to this that's managing a team, whether that's small or large, what are some of the things that you always try and do with your people in order to get the best out of them and get that marrow between ensuring that people love what they do and at the same time they're also productive as well? What, what sort of things go through your mind? What, what, are, you, um, what are you focused on? Yeah, I think it's, it's about development of people, mm -hmm. not just working with people. And I think that's the key to my, I think my personality and my business style is to work with people, but yeah. give them that kind of um, safety net really, let them, mm -hmm. You want them to develop, but you need to kind of push them into situations they might not be that comfortable with, push them yeah. outside of their comfort zone, yeah. but provide a safety net for that as well. Um, we've been talking a lot internally with our teams in terms of development, is trying to get people um, in that mindset as leaders, of all the leaders in the business, is to yeah. let people fail at times, like have a go. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite difficult to do that, I think, at yeah, any that, level. That's a really scary thing mm, to do. So, yeah. But also providing that... Um, that stable place where you actually want to see people progress. And yeah. part of progression is sometimes falling down, yeah, yeah. dusting yourself down and picking yourself and that's back up again. the only time I've ever progressed. You know, the, oh, I look back on my career, I think every time I've progressed is when I've stepped out of my comfort zone. I've mm. done something that immediately you're thinking, I probably shouldn't be here. But then you kind of, you get through it, you develop and you move on. But without people putting you in that position and allowing you to do that, you can't do that. So what, you know, we've got great people, and great managers in the business. Uh, that are starting to do this now and and it's all as we spoke about a moment ago that succession planning and that movement through the practice is all part of their role now as well it's not just mine yeah and i think that's the bit i've had to let go of and they're gonna have to let go of and others um, but actually the rewards of seeing staff and people and projects designs coming through that you've been kind of very slightly involved with but yeah. not as much as i would have been historically seeing that happen is more rewarding than if it you is pull that down itself. to a micro level you know the joiner that's got, that's running a joinery business with three or four other joiners. Mm. What I what I always tend to see is that that person that, that all the pressures on their shoulders. Yeah, I find it really difficult to help somebody and allow somebody to make a mistake from time to time. And it's yeah. that bridging that gap between short term pain for long term reward. Yeah. What at what point in time if you can pinpoint a time? I'm not pressing you for that, but at what point in time did you realise that you know I'm going to have to give people enough rope here to make it themselves versus I'm just going to do the do, do yeah, the do, yeah. do the I do. I think I don't know if I consciously did it initially. I think I did it because I was so busy, and I've take I was just that kind of person. Right. Going, give me more, give me more, give me more, and then I realised throughout that process, oh my god, I can't actually do this. So yeah. I need people around me that can fill those gaps. But now, as I've gotten old and, and gone through the practice, you realize I now consciously plan this and, and that I need my guys coming up to understand that as well. So I'm trying to get that man, mindset into them now because they're not there. Yeah. You know, lots of people aren't, as you said, you know, it's, it's very easy to someone to say, well, I can do that myself. Yeah. I'll, I'll just do it as quicker. And then people come to you with their problems. And you know, we talked about this endlessly and it's so true. I did this for years. The, the one minute manager books, the one minute manager yeah. meets the monkeys. It's like a, a diagram of my life as a manager it, it, originally because I just take that on take do it sort it all out really quickly pass it back mm -hmm. but what you're not doing is allowing those guys to think and develop yeah. themselves and I think that's the bit now that I've realized consciously needs to be pushed into your management style and the mistake the that that person makes yeah 
it's not half as painful as you doing the job for the rest of their life and them not developing. That, no. That's gonna cost you a lot more over a long period of time than the odd mistake here and there. That and, it, and it's demotivation as well, you know, for those people, they you don't realize it at the start, why are you solving their problems, they're happy-go-lucky, and then but then a few years in, they're thinking, why am I not progressing in this yeah. business? I've done all these things they've asked me well, to do. That's 50% your responsibility, yeah, exactly. 50% theirs, yeah. but it's also 50% your responsibility mm. as a leader as well. Okay. So for that person that's probably at that stage, they're listening now and they're going, yeah, this all makes sense. Of course, I bloody need to give people more responsibility. Of course, I need to delegate more, but I'm so busy. How, how do you allocate time to stuff? Do you allocate time to stuff like that? Or is it just when you find the time you do it? Yeah, I do now. Yeah. <laughs> I do a lot better now. Uh, I used to be just whenever I found time or yeah. last thing at night before the next day. Yeah, um, literally. Yeah, literally, literally as you know, yeah. before the next day. Yeah, so now I try and plan. I do plan. I have a, what I call a default diary yeah. where I plan each day. Um, well, each week is, is pretty similar. So I know where I'm going to be in which office uh, and generally what my focus is going to be. So whether it's going to be management meetings, you know, people development, working on the business, business development or what have you. So I plan that and at least I can stick to that day to day. It helps with home life as well because I can mm. actually tell my wife that I'm going to be here or there, you know, yeah. on an evening, which, which is useful. Um, but that really helps. And I'm, what I'm trying to get with my team now is for them to plan hours in the diary as if they're having a meeting with somebody externally, but call it a strategic planning time for themselves yeah. because I know they're not doing it because I wasn't doing it. Um, so I'm kind of actively telling them to do that now and I say, I want to see it, you know, week on week, spend an hour on a Monday or whatever, just looking at what you want to do with your team you know, mm. and planning strategically, whether it's a social event or or a project, a bid, a competition you want to go for, that's the sort of thing I'm asking them to do now. And, and I want that to continue because like you said, it, it just gets pushed to the back of the day. Otherwise yeah. work takes over, life takes over. But and then it's you get- It's twofold there as well, isn't it? Not only do you get some routine and a bit of clarity, so you actually do what you need to do, mm people also see that routine as well. So they'll know that, okay, well, it's Tuesday, I'm gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z, or it's Wednesday, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna make sure I have that conversation with Matt today because I know I've got that time with him. Yeah, and so the other, then, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, the other element of what we've been doing, as you know, is, um, is looking at kind of key business, KPIs, whatever you wanna call it, or, or focuses for, for this year. And we've been doing it at board level. I'm asking our ADs to take it down to A's level and A's mm -hmm. vice versa into the team. So we have a staff reviews that we do every six months uh, that look at behaviors and, and skills, matrices and things like that, which is all good. And we have one-to-ones, but what we're trying to do is get more structure into one-to-ones. So when, mm -hmm. when they do meet, they're meeting about specific elements of their work that they're aiming for at the end yeah. of the year that will help them develop. It will help the business develop. And at the end of the day, it should change the bottom line as well. Yeah, um, so that's that's people having specific goals that they're working towards yeah. and, and look at, looking at some KPIs. So, that's over and above what the business is there to do. Yeah. That's something that they're specifically working on to either improve their skills or um, add value into the business or whatever. Yeah, Have I think you've seen a benefit to, to doing that? Or? Yeah, the, the, I th it's a, just a change in narrative in terms of how you speak to people. Yeah, um, It can be very top down as a leader to say, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, but actually getting in conversation with somebody and exploring collaboratively what they want to do is a huge difference to actually saying to somebody, I need you to do X, Y, and Z this year. Mm. Um, and generally they come to the, you know, they will come to the conclusion that will affect the business and work right, you know, will support the bottom line as well. You just got to help them find that together. Yeah. Uh, but once they've got their own view and their own goals, which is kind of predetermined from inside, yeah. the, the, you know, the engagement level is completely different. Uh, and that's what we've realized, you know, the last few months is using that at all levels within the business is helping to change where we're going as a business. There's also a buy-in from that as well. Mm. So there's the difference between asking somebody a question and telling somebody what to do mm. is the, the gap is, is huge. Yeah. So if I told you, for instance, right, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, because I've said it, it's false. Mm. It's almost like you're doing it for me versus you asking somebody a question, what is it that you need to work on in the next 12 months? Yeah. And get them to think, well, the moment they say it, it becomes true mm. and it's something that they can buy into and the, even if it just takes them from fourth to fifth in gears, yeah. they're gonna get so much more done because it's something that they actually wanna do. It's gonna help with the wider thing that the business is doing. But also asking them why they wanna do it as well. Right. That is such an important question and we, obviously we talked a lot about um, 
Simon Sinek and start with yeah, why yeah. and all of that. But it's not only about the wider business stuff. It's actually more why internally do you want to do that? Right. What's going to motivate you to do that? You, I can't create their motivation for yeah. them. So I've got to try and understand what is it behind why they've come up with this idea. Have they come up with it because they want it's good for me and they want me to nod and say that's a great idea? Yeah. Or have they really come up with it because they truly believe it and they're passionate about it? And going back to what we talked about earlier, that's what's driven me for years is knowing that this is what I want to do. It's what I'm passionate yeah. about. So I need to try and find that. I and mean, we need to find as a business with that individual staff, what is it that they want to do and how do we support them in that? Love that. Um, I want you to, uh, how long do you say you've been in Bon Brian now? 18, 18 years, years, I think. Years. Yeah, I think so. I must have had a really bad paper out of it. <laughs> 18 years, wow, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna take yourself back to 2003. Yeah. You're just starting, how did, did you join as, a, just join as an architect? I or joined an as a junior part or? two. So the way Reba works yeah, for, yeah. is Reba one, two, and three. Yeah. Part one is three years, you do a year out. Part two is two years and your master's, you do another year out and your professional exams. So in between that, finishing my master's, I came up to Sheffield and I took an extra year just to get a job and, mm -hmm. and, and buy a flat and stuff like that. And so, and so I took a, not a year off, a year off getting Reba qualifications, but yeah, that's yeah. when I started at Bomb Brian, yeah. Right, and okay. the reason, I started is that one of my directors now, Jeff Halliwell, who I work with, who works out of the London office, is he, when I went to all the other architectural practices, he outlined to me at the very beginning, this is an opportunity for you to shape it how you want to. And no one had ever said that to me. Mm. You know, as every interview I'd ever been to. Crazy how a conversation 18, yeah. 19 years is still stuck with you. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. Just and it's that the, one thing. Yeah. Because it was more, it was, you know, the feedback from my portfolio was, this is absolutely fantastic. We want you to come here you can shape this how you want to. It was not, you know, I won't name the practice, but other practice said, oh, you can work on this job and you can do yeah, the toilet yeah. details, or you could come and work for this name in London and mm. get it on your CV. And that's the sort of rhetoric I was hearing. And for somebody to say, oh, it's effectively a blank piece of paper. To me, in my, who I am as a person, my personality was like, wow, this is exciting. Whereas others might have run a mile, but yeah. he probably saw it in me. It's like, this is what he wants. He wants that opportunity. And yeah, it completely changed my life, obviously. Love that. Mm -hmm. So you're back in 2003 as you. You're seeing young, hungry Matt Horton. What advice would you give him? God, it's a really tough one, that. You know? Yeah, I know. Because there's things that I've done. Because life's a journey, and you've yeah. got to go through some of those things in order to get the battle scars that will serve mm. you well. But if there was just one thing that you could say, hey, look, watch out for that, or focus more on this, or you know, meet John earlier. For me, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I probably wasn't ready for you. No, maybe years, not. Right? It was uh, probably just be more confident in myself. Right. That's the bit I think I've always struggled with until very recently, you know, last few years, I think as I've gotten older, hit 40, you have kids, and perspective changes quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and I guess I always felt like I was, um, what's the word, just, what's the word I'm looking for? Just living a slightly different life. I was sort of living two different lives. One was like my- to be some acting. Yeah, like acting, like yeah, acting, basically, yeah. yeah. So I felt like I was, I was like, not, am I really belonging in this place and where yeah. I'm at? And I always found myself in meetings and situations, I guess because of the maturity I had as, a, as an architect at that time or whatever mm. I was doing. And everyone was much older than me, you know, 20 years plus. And I'm sitting there thinking that they must know a lot more about this than me. Um, and that gave me kind of anxiety and made me worried about things. And actually, I, and I always tell this to our guys now, you know, you, especially when you're designing a project, you yeah. know more about it than anybody in the room at whatever level you're at, right? So don't go in feeling like you know that. If you know 98% and they, and there's 2% you don't know, don't worry about the 2%. Focus on the bit that you know. Would you say that you were a two percent oh, guy time, for a yeah. while? Yeah, I'd be worrying about what I'd, I'd leave the meeting and thinking, "Oh God, I can't believe I said that," or "I really should have got known that," and you know, and, and crucify myself over the two or three percent yeah. that I didn't know. And I know lots of people do that. Lots of architects do it, not just that, but people that generally. Yeah. Even social situations, I used to do it. I'd really? lie awake at night and think, "Oh my God, I can't believe I said this to that person." Wow. Yeah, really. And it's and then as I've gotten older, it's not that I care less. I've just learned to compartmentalize those th that, those thoughts because it doesn't serve anybody. Yeah, I say to, to people, a true measure of confidence is what you say to yourself, mm. about yourself, whilst you buy yourself. Yeah, yeah. That is a true measure of a confident person mm. because you could see a peacock in the room that's flamboyant and mm. 
that doesn't necessarily make them a confident person. What what makes somebody confident is what they say to themselves up here. Yeah. Um, so being really aware of that, shit, am I actually talking to myself like that mm. whilst I'm whilst I'm on my own? And that sort of portrays such a negative self-image, which will then impact on on your confidence. Yeah. So and I think I was going to authenticity like to me, yeah, to for as a leader is the most important thing. Right. So I, what do you mean by that? So I mean, authenticity is branded about so yeah. much. What what is authenticity to you? What do you mean when you I say? Think when you say, wait, except so when you say you're going to do something, you're going to deliver on it. Is yeah. One part of it, um, but when you say something about the business and about you, that it's 100% honest and true. Right. I don't. I, that's who I am. I can't change that, and it's sometimes unfortunate, and sometimes I say yeah, things yeah. that maybe don't work out for yeah. me or the business. But I'd rather know that because I've spent a lot of time chasing clients and people potentially within the industry that I thought I should be friends with or I should be working with because they may have a big project or whatever. And the more I've gone through this process, the more I've realized you need to work with people that you trust and respect. Right. And I think most people, you hear the phrase, people buy from people. It couldn't be yeah. more true, obviously. It couldn't be more true. Um, so I think you have to spend time building relationships with people. The work will come mm. beyond that. Don't chase. How do you trust people? How do I trust you in terms yeah. of like my process? Yeah, so you, you, well, you didn't ask me if no, process. No. It could be something that you, you're not even sure of. But again, leaders have issues with trust. It's mm. a natural thing that passing on the mantle to someone. So, what's the what is the saying? Trust is it is it earned or given? What about what about you? Do you to think, give somebody yeah. trust? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's given. I don't. It's earned beyond that. But I think you have to give somebody the trust, and then they can earn it and keep exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do that. Otherwise, it's a it's not a two-way thing. Yeah, it's uh, you're giving. You're not. You know, you, you're a. What's the word? You kind of you're forcing somebody to make a choice that maybe they're not ready for. And right. actually, I'd rather just get open armed and say, "This is how I trust you." You know, that this is how I feel about it. So I think it empowers them rather than saying, "Here's something," but if you balls it up, basically, yeah, then that trust so the is three gone. big takeaways that I took from this: be authentic to yourself mm. and to other people. Trust, trust is not earned; it's given, and then. It's earned over time to be kept. Planning in advance to make sure that you're making time for your people is, is really important, not just for you, um, but also for them as well, so they can see some patterns, so they know um, as, and, as, and when, as and when they can go for you. And at a deeper level, really understanding what people want yeah. and how they want it, and allowing that business to become a vehicle for them to be able to go out and get it. Yeah. So that's, that's a about, yeah, right? very good summary. Yeah. Well, thank you. Good at this. I hope so. Because <laughs> you know, I've got a few more of these to do. If, if it's not very good, I'll probably only do two or three more. So, <laughs> I'll finish by saying thanks so much for being on Real Talk. No problem. Thanks, thanks Matt. Job.